Okay. I think I'm finally ready to go. Let's do this. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists of all time. Today, we are going to look... Oops, I didn't get this ready. Come on. I bought a new computer two weeks ago. It's sitting in a box down here, and I have still not had a chance to take it out of the box and this old computer is driving me crazy it's so slow oh and you probably hear the music right now stuttering and stopping as it's trying to do two things at once oh it feels like uh this computer was invented back in the stone age okay there we go okay let's no i want hmm okay i got it what an eventful beginning to this episode okay here we go. This is the painting we are going to recreate today. This is a painting by Kazimir Malevich, the most famous and the single most important Ukrainian artist in history. And we've looked at a number of great artists. This is, however, the most famous and the most important. And I would go as far to venture to say that M Malevich, his uh he was perhaps arguably the single most influential artist of the 20th century and paintings like this the very famous black square changed the world and as a person of ukrainian descent myself that's kind of uh kind of exciting <laughs> i guess and considering what's going on in the world right now celebrating Malevich and recognizing his importance in, in, in history and the importance of Ukrainian in history uh, helps counter certain narratives about Ukrainians not even existing. <laughs> anyway, um, I know for some people look at this and are like, are you kidding me? We're going to paint this. And you're, wait, you're, you've got to be kidding me. You're telling me this painting is one of the most important paintings in human history and changed the direction of art and of arguably how art affects the world, the entire course of world history. Yeah, actually I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely saying that. And we're going to walk through how to make a painting like this. I'm even going to talk about if anyone's interested in getting a little bit of the cracks on here using some crackling paste. We're going to use a little bit of tape. So we've done those things in the past in previous episodes, but this is a beginner's episode where we're going to look at, at some very basic painting techniques to help people at the beginning of their painting journey. So let's get right into it here. So the, the steps that we're going to take here, we're going to get the image onto the canvas. I'm going to show you where to download the free templates. But, you know, the, the this painting is fairly straightforward. It's a square. <laughs> and uh, But if you want to use the template, you can download the template and it might help you a little bit. And then we're going to get this, a little bit of stain on the canvas. for Because even though this is a relatively quote-unquote simple painting, there's probably more to it than you might originally imagine just looking at it. Then we'll take a second as the paint dries to talk a little bit about the biography of Malevich. And then we'll uh, we'll start kind of with some of these. This is, this is usually for more of our landscape figurative paintings. So it's going to be maybe a little bit of a different direction here. And I want to do two paintings as well. There's a there's a second square, the the white square. <laughs> We've got a black square and a white square, and um, so probably in two hours we should be done. We should be able to get both of them done in that period of time. 
So let's uh, let's jump right in. Let's talk about how to get this image onto the canvas. So the first thing we want to do is there's a link to a Dropbox folder in the description below. And in that Dropbox folder, you're going to see some of our most simple paintings. These are our introductory how to mix a color wheel, etc. cetera, uh, the, the types of paint we use. And then you're going to see these lettered uh, um, folders here. These are for our most basic paintings um, that are very easy for anyone to recreate and also covering some essential steps that we would need to go forward. And then after that, you've got over 150 other paintings for anyone who's watching who's like, ah, I don't know, I'm not interested in abstract painting. I want something like the Mona Lisa. There's the Mona Lisa somewhere in here uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, lots of Picasso, Van Gogh. Some of the most popular paintings in human history are here and ready for you to paint. Anyway, we'll go back up here, Malevich. And here we've got six files in here and there's there's the original files as well as two tracings that I made on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And there's just ones in JPEG format and one's PDF format, right? So you can download those, print those out, and then I'm gonna show you how to transfer that onto Canvas. So I'm gonna talk over top of this while this plays and just explain sort of the process. So you see I'm using a nine by 12 sized canvas that I ordered off of Amazon. I like the ones that, that I get down and rather than the ones at the dollar store, they're $2 as opposed to a dollar and they're 10 times the quality. And you can see I've printed out the outline I downloaded from the Dropbox on my regular inkjet laser jet printer. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can use a photocopier. Um, at uh, like a UPS or FedEx, Kinko store, Staples, etc. And then I am here now just doing a quick little measurement because I think I'm going to do this uh, using my ruler. And did I get... Oh, so, so what I'm doing here is just making sure that this is roughly in the center. Oh, and some app is trying to update in the background beach ball of death. Okay, so now I've got my carbon transfer paper. I'm going to slide it underneath here because I'm happy with where that square is. And then I'm going to use my ruler when it stops stuttering and actually plays. There we go. Pretty straightforward stuff here. Um, okay. This computer, I have, okay. So it's, uh, okay. <sighs> that is just not going to behave, is it? So here's the other one that I'm getting ready to do. And let's see if this will behave. Okay, so let's just skip that because it's pretty self-explanatory. We've done this in many previous episodes there. I only have so much patience. So I've done the outlines for these two paintings here. All right, let's just zoom back out a little bit. So I've got that one and this one here. Right now, again, they're they're very simple, so you could easily just draw those out yourself. And I will say that Malevich, in many, we'll take a look at his his work here in just a few minutes once we get these paintings started. He he, some of these squares because he did this painting a few times are not entirely symmetrical. They're not perfectly geometrical. So if they're a little bit crooked or off, that's totally fine. That would be in line with some of the rest of his work. Uh, lots of comments in the chat there. There's uh, Paula, and Roxana, and Kathy, Sandra, Heidi. Lots of people commenting and watching. That's great. Um, I'll get the, the, the uh, painting started and then I'll take a look at some of the questions. So, um, once we get these done, I should also just mention that just while I'm here at this stage. 
that there is a private Facebook group that I encourage you to join. There's a bunch of new people that joined just yesterday from my in-person classes here in Vancouver. Good to see a bunch of new people in there as well. And uh, I encourage you to take a photograph of the painting that you made today or uh, made what, whether it's a Malevich painting or something else of flowers or horses, whatever it is you're interested in. Up, join the Facebook group, upload it, and then once a week, and I think it might be this weekend, I have to schedule, look at the schedule myself, we'll do a feedback episode where I look at all of your work and I give you guys feedback. So it's an opportunity for a little bit of interaction here. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to our next step. So the next step is I'm gonna stain the canvas. And that's what this term here means. The imprematura is an Italian word for the first layer of paint or the first application of paint onto a canvas. And traditionally what that is, is less of like painting and more of a staining technique. And artists traditionally use like a, uh, a rusty red color, a brown, to get the painting started. If you've been watching me for any period of time, you know that I use instead my warm yellow pure well for many different reasons which we've gone over ad nauseum over the years but um mostly because it's just very simple we don't have to mix any colors to get the painting started we can just apply that color and at the end of the day the difference between a warm yellow and a brown of which there is a difference but whether people will notice it is is debatable even experienced artists probably are not going to notice the difference so that's why i do it because especially for a beginner's class it just helps get this whole process started so this is the color i'm going to be using this azo yellow deep from amsterdam i'm not sponsored or paid by them or anything um it's just a nice cheap uh a um set of of paints in fact i just bought some more today and for all of these paints, I paid $100 Canadian for the large tubes of paint, right? So, I mean, I always think like, that's amazing that I could get all of these paints for 100 bucks, and this is gonna occupy me for about 60 or 70 paintings. And hey, you know, if you're looking for a hobby to get into, 100 bucks that will keep you busy for five or six months like I don't know what else is cheaper than that okay so um, if you don't want to use this brand or you got other colors here's a few other things like you can use golden the golden makes a, a really good professional grade of paint this is more of like a student grade paint but we get, get good things out of it too right Liquitex this is also their their they make a higher grade of paint this is their cheaper paint the Liquitex basics and again so I'm just pointing out that you can use this same color it has a different name might be slightly different but with all of these brands you can use the same set of paints in what is known as a split primary palette so Winsor Newton uh, Artist Loft from Michael's art supply chain uh, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney. And again, we've talked in our in those very first episodes on how to paint. We covered this in much more depth, right? So let's get some of this paint on here. So I'm going to put my warm yellow onto here, and I realize I forgot my water. Okay, <laughs> take my water. Oh yeah. And I guess since I'm going to be doing two paintings, maybe I'm going to. That's a too much water, but. And now I need a bit more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that enough? Let's get a bit more. It's very, it's very scientific, uh, obviously, <laughs> this method. So let's stir this up. This is going to be kind of thin, which is fine. If I wanted to make it a little bit thicker, I could just add a little bit more paint or put a little bit less water in. Um, the water is going to... This is the only time I ever use water when 
I, I make um, a painting, right? Because again, we're using, we're just staining the surface and because we're painting directly onto this um, gessoed canvas, gesso is a little bit different than paint. It is acrylic based, but it's got like a plaster powder in it. So it absorbs water really, really well. Anyone who's ever, you know, broken a leg and or a finger or arm and it had one of those old plaster casts, they don't, I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, now they're like fiberglass casts. At least the last time I broke a bone, that's what I, they set my bones in. Um, but if I, I've broken a lot of bones throughout my life and I remember those uh, old timey plaster casts and you know you're not allowed to get it wet because if you get it wet it gets soggy and stinky and starts to fall apart right because that plaster absorbs water really well maybe too well I'm just gonna let that dry for a second and then I'll brush out the <laughs> about an hour ago I was going through some Facebook comments and someone was saying ah you talk too much always blabbing on and <laughs> and uh, it's like yeah that's true I do talk a lot and if you don't like it you don't have to watch it and if you want to skip ahead you can skip ahead I guess that's the price of what, you know, you get what you pay for here on YouTube. <laughs> and, uh... I guess some people like it. There's, there's... Some people don't mind. I've had a number of people ask me to turn these... To just convert the videos into podcasts. Because they just sit there... And they're like painting to the... While I'm talking away. Blabbing away. So... I always think it's funny that there's... There's something for everyone, and there's always people giving me advice on how to get more views and everything, of which, you know, I know I've been on YouTube doing things for a couple of decades, basically since YouTube started, and I know all the secrets, but I'm also just like, at this stage of my life, pretty content with where I am, and no real ambition anymore to take over the world. If one or two people are happy, with what's going on, then I'm happy. So, that's a little bit of a, not a rant, just a, a little bit of information, I guess. Um, yeah, not everybody's trying to get a million views and to be famous, right? Some of us are just content with life, and hey, that's where I am. So, that's the my first layer. It is a little bit lighter than sometimes I normally do, because I could have put a bit more yellow in there. I'm going to blow dry this, and then I'm actually going to paint a little bit of white over top of this. So, um, let's... Actually, I should also just mention... I don't think I showed the other painting here. Oops. So this is the other painting we're gonna be doing, this white square on white background, the supremacist composition. And of course this one. So what I wanna do now is I'm gonna blow dry this yellow and then I'm gonna paint the sort of background white onto things. And I think we could probably get away with using the same white on both of these. Now these are two slightly different whites, um, but we'll get both of them started and I think most people will be happy with whatever sort of white we end up with, right? 
Okay, so let's move... Actually, um, yeah, I'm going to move this out of the way for a second. I'll let that dry while I mix my paint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some white in the center here. Uh, let's get a bit more. And now I'm just going to mix a little bit of color. Like if we look at this painting, what color would you say this is? Right? I mean, most people say, oh, it looks white. Okay, sure. But we can see at the very top here, oops, this is white, right? It, it's a, it's a, a color that has no other colors in or white essentially has all the colors depending on how you want to look at it right um so clearly it's different than this this is a bit more of a gray and it also appears to have a bit of blue in it and i it's it's very hard to, to say because it's tinted so strongly but it does look like kind of a grayish coolish blue uh when i when i see that now the maybe even a bit of a, a brownish blue gray i don't know it's pretty hard to say so let's get a few colors on here and we'll, we'll try to mix a little bit of that color so i'm going to put a little bit of my cool blue and my uh that's cool red so let's put some warm red and i know this is like people are like are you kidding me we're why are we going to just paint it white and get over it well you know I, again i always think it's important for us to understand how to do some of this basic color mixing um and so let's do some basic color mixing so what i want to do i'm going to make a gray and i'm not using any black i might I don't even know if I'm going to use black for the center of the canvas because if even if we look at this, that looks more purple to me than actual black. So let's make a black. Let's, so let's, I'm actually going to make it use a, I'm, let's mix this whole thing up. So to start, I'm going to take some of my warm red. I'm going to put it over here and I'm going to mix it into my cool blue. And because these colors are opposite from one another on the... Well, almost opposite one another on the color wheel, we get this very muted purple. I mean, we could basically use that same purple for our square. It might just be a little bit too purple. So instead, to make it go... To pull it, because it actually exists a little bit down here. In fact, since let's just do this properly, right? So we just mixed our warm red with our cool blue, and we got this really dark purple. It, it's pretty hard to tell there because it's in one big solid clump or mass tone, you might say. When we spread it out, it gets a little bit thinner and we can see the purple in there. We want to have a black or to make a gray. So what we wanna do is take our cool yellow, mix it with that color, and it's gonna pull it into the neutral core right so if you think of this like an elastic band and then you're pulling that elastic band with this color that's how we get a gray so i'm going to mix this in here and it's going to basically kill the saturation of the color and make it a neutral color so it won't have uh, any saturation at all and you know, again, it's it's all you. I'm just doing this by by sight here. I'm not measuring anything. So what ends can happen is that color could look more green if I've got more yellow and blue in here, and less red. It could look a little bit greenish, like a really really dark dark green. Excuse me. If I've got a lot of yellow and red and less blue, it's going to look a little bit more brown. If I got a little bit more blue and red and no yellow, we have purple, as you saw before. But for all intents and purposes, that's a really nice gray, I think. And it, and if you can't tell, because you're just like, I don't know what color that is, then let's let's learn how to do that. Let's. I'm just gonna this paintbrush. 
yeah, I'm going to get that paint off. I was thinking of maybe saving it, but, you know, acrylic paint dries so fast that we don't want that brush drying out. In fact, actually, just by stirring it up, you could see, oh, that kind of still looks a little bit purple. Now, I would hesitate to say that's exactly what this color looks like, because that could be, you still see some paint up in the metal part, the ferrule, as it's called. Looks like so that probably accounts more than anything for that color. Um, let me use this big brush again. Did I, I haven't cleaned that, so let's... Roxana says, are we still waiting? I'm unsure. not sure what's happening there so let's I'm also going to use a bunch of matte medium here in a moment and matte medium is just clear paint it has no pigment in it so let's first mix up our color here we've got this white and I'm going to take a bit of this paint you notice how little I took just a little bit I just dipped it in there because when I mix it into my white, it's going to change that color very quickly. And maybe it's hard to see how much that color just changed, but it is definitely not white anymore. I didn't put that, you know, there was maybe, what would you say, 40 to 1 ratio, and it already changed. So if I put too much of that in there, then, you know, I'm going to have to use five tubes of this paint to get it white again. Like, you're, I mean, it's... So you always want to err on the side of caution before you add, but I am going to add a little bit more. Um, in fact, I'm going to add even, even more here because I'm going to add my matte medium into this mixture and that's going to make this color thin again. You can even see a bit of that yellow coming out of the color here. So let's put... Something stuck in there. On my list of giant list of things to do, I've got clean my paint tubes because they're all jammed up here. Okay. <sighs> okay, so now this is going to make this white much more transparent. Again, I want to make sure that any of that yellow that was deep inside the up on the in my brush there is not going to leak out as I'm painting. So I want to make sure it's stirred in well. Okay. The other thing, adding a little bit of matte medium is going to make it transparent enough that I'm still going to be able to see my lines and a bit of this uh, yellow. And then I should blow dry this too. So let's do that quick blow dry. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to mute the microphone for a second.
Okay. <laughs> um, let's do this one here first. I think I'm, and I probably will need to mix a little bit more of my white after I finish this first layer. So we'll, we'll see how much we can get done. So we'll apply this all over here. You might notice like, oh no, the, the white, the, the square has disappeared. It'll come back. It's that first, um, as we paint it, sometimes it disappears at first, but With the thing with matte medium is it tends to dry kind of quickly once you get it spread thin. So once we do a little bit of this brushing, we're going to want to stop. And... I think that's good. Um, let's. So it's it's going to change a little bit. Like I, I'm imagining right now, it looks pretty even. If we hit this with the blow dryer right now, we're just going to start noticing in some places it's going to be a little bit more opaque, and we're going to and a little bit more transparent in certain areas. Like even I can see some of this yellow coming through. If we look at them side by side, right, it, it does make me think maybe I could have gone actually more gray than what we what I have right here. Um, but let's let's do the other one and then we'll we'll think for a second, right? So move that one out of the way. Let's get this one and just take a look at the color here. Because this one's got a bit more of a brownish quality, a little bit more warm yellow even in there. So it's almost like that. Let's let's I'm gonna mix that color. Let's let's try to do do that and see if we can get a little bit closer to that. I'm gonna just use the same area here. I'm just gonna put some more white paint into here. Come on. Oh, that's a lot. So I may just take a bit out and use later. Let's put some matte medium in. And then let's take some of our black, right, and just mix this. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do, just to give it a bit more of a tint, or not a tint, uh, to add a little bit more color in there, is let's take some of our uh, yellow and red, mix that into an orange. Let's take just a little bit of blue, and we're getting now a bit more of a brown. Hmm, maybe just a little bit more blue. And I've made a, this is very, very thin. Like I don't need to make much because now I'm just gonna take this and mix this in here. And that's now maybe, the, well, we'll see. It's going to change too when we mix it in with our on top of our warm yellow. Looks a little bit fleshy there. Actually, in for my eyes, that looks pretty good. I'm actually going to just add more white and a little bit more matte medium in here. Just so I don't run out halfway through. The last time, the previous painting, I almost ran out by the end, so... That looks good. Okay, I'm happy with that. 
We'll just move the canvas into place. And just spread as much paint. You'll notice like there's, when I'm doing this kind of thing, I just try to get all the paint on there as quickly as possible spread it everywhere and then I go in and try to even it out Okay, I might have to stop right now because if I keep on going, what's going to happen is, and I can already see this at the edges, I'm going to start kind of peeling some of that, not peeling, but um, the paint starts to kind of rub off and even starts to kind of create these like wave shapes. So I think that's okay for right now. Let's, um, I'm going to blow dry both of these paintings. Like I think, I'm not sure how well again that comes across, but I can definitely see the yellow is coming through stronger and stronger and stronger. So well, I'm, I might do a second application here with just a lot more matte medium. Okay, I'm gonna mute. Okay, so I am really torn at this moment whether I want to do more. I let's. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do an, a, another layer here because I feel like I'm not. It's not quite where I want it to be. And, and these are again paintings that on on the surface appear to be really simple. And yet there's a lot going on and because we really just have two colors in this case we got two whites and here we've got a white 
and a black although again we're, we're complicating what those colors actually are I think it it uh, it's not a problem to spend a little bit more time trying to get the surfaces closer to what we want uh, again that's too much white though because this next layer is going to be much thinner so let's just take a bit of that white out okay I'm going to put lots of matte medium mostly this is going to be clear paint this particular layer and I'm just gonna this was the paint that I used to make here and I'm just gonna mix that in again I'm gonna put more matte medium in there I tend to um, always err on the side of using less paint generally just because I, I have confidence in myself of being able to make that color again but for a situation like this you this might be the one occasion where making a little bit more paint might be beneficial because if you're if you you're, you're doing a layer like this and you you run out halfway through that can be kind of a bind right so yeah that's nice okay that's i feel so good about okay yeah that's so i still see or i my eye is uh apprehending still that warm yellow underneath here but it is very subtle very subtle and yeah that is what that's what the doctor ordered that is awesome so we have now a surface that yeah i'm sure if this was on TikTok or something people would be like it's just a gray canvas big deal but when you see these kinds of paintings in person it's really important that you that it, it's just you have to see often abstract painters will talk about you you just need to see it in person for you to to appreciate it because the, those colors just don't come across quite as well on camera and i used to think that was pretty ridiculous when i was in college but as time has gone on i'm like you know what that's kind of true mm -hmm. so i'm just gonna i'm gonna use the same color on my brush even though it's got a bit of a gray or brown in here um, I'll put a bunch more matte medium in fact let's put it here that's, that's a substantial amount of matte medium let's use some more white and our bit oh that's a lot of gray and let's mix that up here Again, we want to make sure that's mixed in really well. I don't mind if there's even a little bit of that previous brown in this color. Again, the more complex that surface is with just little bits of color in there, you know, are, I would say, very desirable. Yeah, that is gorgeous. That is awesome. Okay, that's, oh, that makes me so much happier. I mean, you know, I think we all have those experiences as artists when we make, we start a painting and we're like, should I do it or not? Should I do this step? Is it done? And then you decide, oh, I'm just going to try it. There are times where you regret it, but I would say most of the times, just my own anecdotal experience, I'm always like, whoa, that was, I'm so glad I did that. Like it definitely needed that. So cool. Okay, I've got to stop because I'm going to start getting a little stuttering. Um, brush strokes.
Not that his surfaces were perfect either, but I always say like this painting's got to exist on its own beyond uh, the what was you know it's not like I'm gonna hang up a photograph of this painting next to it, so it's got to satisfy my own interests. Okay, let's um. I'm going to blow dry these really quickly and then we're going to talk about Malevich's biography. I just want this to be kind of that to be done so that I can just move right on to that step when we get there. So I'm going to mute. Okay, and then just before I move on here, I just want to, I know I'm super anal retentive, I want to just see if I can clean my tabletop, I guess not, it's just <laughs> blow dried this paint and made it, uh, anyway, I think that's going to make the microphone pop. So, we'll just have a little bit of, I feel like this is somehow also very Malevich <laughs> right there, okay. So let's move on here. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to talk about Kazimir Malevich. <laughs> okay, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about Kazimir Malevich's biography, a little bit about who he was and why he's so important to. Uh, not only the history of painting and art, but I think even more so in, in terms of human history. And it's not, I don't think I'm overstating things to, to say something so dramatic. Okay, again, there's our Facebook group. Join the Facebook group, upload your painting there. So let's talk about who this artist was. And so Malevich was born in 1879 and dies in 1935, meaning he died of cancer at the young age of 56, you know, um, just a, a little over a decade older than I am right now, which is kind of scary. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, 
during that time he accomplished a lot and he had many different periods of art in various different styles so uh, let's scroll down here we'll, we'll kind of sort of get into a bunch of here let's go just to his biography so uh, Malevich is born in Kiev, which is the capital of Ukraine. Um, back then, however, Kiev was part of the the of of Russia, and uh, or the Russian Federation, as it, as it was known, right? And or the Russian Empire, sorry. And um, so he was also his parents were of Polish descent, so he spoke Polish probably at home with his parents. He spoke Russian because Russia was occupying Ukraine at the time. Uh, and he also spoke Ukrainian because a lot of the people in his community spoke Ukrainian. And, and Ukraine literally means borderlands. Like that's the, 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 the root of, of the, the word. And Ukraine is always, we've talked about this in previous episodes focusing on Ukrainian artists, but if you haven't seen those, it's bears just quick repeating that Ukraine has been one of those places in the world that has switched hands, has been occupied by all sorts of different countries. It was occupied by kind of the, the Polish-Lithuanian uh, empire for years. It was occupied by Vikings, by... Uh, Mongols, by uh, what is by Persians, Iranians, by um, uh, sort of the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, uh, by the Turks, um, obviously by Russia, many times back. So Ukraine has sort of switched hands many times, which is one of the things that makes Ukraine quite unique is the blending of so many different peoples and cultures, you know, in a, in a way that, you know, Canada and the United States are, are similar countries in that there's a, a very diverse ethnic makeup of those countries. And Ukraine is one of maybe the the places in Europe where where we see that like historically a lot like now Europe is, is very diverse but there have been times in European history where they were very uh, mono ethnic and but Ukraine anyway his, historically has been very very diverse so it's not an it's not surprising that he spoke three different languages potentially there were people living in a city nearby who spoke uh, different, like may, may have spoke, um, uh, uh, what, what, I mean, they might have spoke some type of Persian, like I said, uh, as well as Russian and Ukrainian. Anyway, well, getting a little bit sidetracked, but, uh, um, his father, um, was, uh, a, 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 a sugar farmer, or, or was involved in the distribution of sugar, and so he spent a lot of time, I think, is it saying here some, somewhere here? Yeah, he managed a sugar factory. And he was the son of, he was the first of 14 children. And, you know, we just celebrated Mother's Day a few days ago. And when you think of that poor woman who had 14 children, <laughs> only nine of which survived into adulthood is, is uh, you know, that... That is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> um, but that's a huge family, right? And being the firstborn son of a family that large, you could imagine sort of the pressures that he would have felt. You know, historically, the first son of a family sort of bears a lot of the responsibility. And uh, so he spent a lot of time traveling around with his father going to to buy sugar from different farms for the factory and meeting lots of peasants lots of farmers lots like spending time in both the, the kind of the industrial area of kiev as well as the rural area farmland surrounding it which is probably different than the experience of a lot of other children who may have been sort of one or the other and especially you know, he's he's sort of growing up during the explosion of the Industrial Revolution. So he spends a lot of time seeing 
the, the, the contrast of farm life and factory life. And in a way that, again, most people may not, I mean, I think obviously industrial revolution sort of happened and people would have may have moved from the farm to the city and that would have been a, a bit of a shock. But most once they sort of made that transition, they probably weren't going back and forth every day to and seeing that kind of shock like once it happened that just sort of became accustomed to it and i think especially when we start talking about uh, the 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 inspiration for some of his work i think that it is becomes really important so um i think it says here so he, he didn't really he wasn't really interested or didn't express an interest in art until he was a little bit older until his early teens um, but he would have seen artwork by spending time at all these various different homes of people he was visiting along with his father. And obviously in Ukraine, uh, uh, textiles, the textile like clothing and the patterns in Ukrainian clothing are very, very important. And those patterns are also tend to be very geometric along with like very floral patterns, right? Um, and you know, I, I think that there's almost like in Ukrainian culture, this the, the, the patterning is uh, gets to this sort of Baroque, overwhelming intensity. Like, so you, like in a traditional Ukrainian, um, like a, a, a men's outfit, for instance, you might have the collar in, in this in this intense Baroque patterning and then white. Right, so there's these again, this almost like these contrasts of like intense patterning, solid color, right? And we'll see this when we look at his work here in a moment. I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of maybe taking some tangents and reading into his biography, maybe more so. But I just think about what has influenced my own life as an artist and how, um, uh, how I've been influenced by places and things that I've seen as well. Um. So after after his father dies, he moves to Moscow and he goes to the school of painting there. And while he's there, he starts meeting a number of other artists. Um, he eventually moves to St. Petersburg, where he meets Vladimir Tatlin, um, who Tatlin is a is a Russian artist, uh, Ukrainian artist. I didn't know. Tatlin is Ukrainian? Oh, well, that's exciting. I, I always thought Tatlin... Okay, so now I'm going to have to do a Tatlin episode because Tatlin is one of the... the I, that's... Wow, that, that's very cool. Tatlin is uh, probably... Okay, now I've got to show you the most famous thing that Tatlin's famous for because it's probably the most iconic image besides Malevich's Black Square. Um, the... Monument to the Third International. So I don't know if, if anyone's ever seen this before, but this is sort of like Russia's response to the Eiffel Tower. And this is the design for it. It was never built. I think they should build this as because this would be incredible. It was meant to be a um, radio tower in the middle of Moscow. But... As we'll, we'll see here shortly, one of the things that happens is the early pioneers of the Russian Revolution, like Trotsky and Lenin, really embrace this uh, modern art that is coming out of Russia and Ukraine. And when Stalin takes over, he, he wants nothing of that. He, he wants the the socialist realist style this propaganda men and women they're all strong working in the fields and tatlin malevich and a lot of other artists leave russia or are exiled or executed right um but anyway so during this time in in russia where malevich moves to he meets all of these artists a lot of them happen to actually be ukrainian that he meets abroad which is not unusual. Anybody who's been on a, a trip somewhere, if you're sitting at a restaurant and you hear someone maybe talking, you're in France and you hear someone talking English and they go, oh, just talking up, oh, my buddy in Toronto, or, you know, when we get back to, and you're like, what? Oh, there's another Canadian over there. And you go, end up striking up a conversation and maybe become friends with them. I know when I went to art school down in Los Angeles, 
some of my best friends happen to also be the Canadians that were also studying down there. Um, anyway, he becomes friends with this this group of artists who are all like-minded younger people who eventually um, are, become very important in their own right, and a few of whom we've already talked about. Um, I mean, you could see here uh, Sonia Delaney, who we painted. Um, she's one of my favorite artists. Another Ukrainian artist, as I said, Tatlin. Um, we're going to be doing uh, Arkhipenko painting. Uh, he was mostly a sculptor, however, and Alexandra Exter. She's also very important, although she's considered Ukrainian, but was born elsewhere. Um, uh, Berluk. Remember him and his brother David, right? Also, he met there. So there's this this uh, interest in uh, in these young artists and there's that are painting together. And maybe let's start looking at uh, some of his work that he's making, kind of at the early 1900s, right? This these this kind of style that might be you might say is impressionist or post-impressionist like we you know we looked at Monet and Seurat or Soro and like pointillism and then around this time things start to kind of change a little bit as the news of what's going on in Paris in Berlin starts to make its way to Moscow where he's living right and that news is of the avant-garde that is just beginning, right? You have Picasso, Matisse, who are kind of starting these two different strains of, of, of avant-garde art. Picasso, you have Cubism that is sort of begins at the 1908, but doesn't really start till like maybe 1911. You have uh, Henri Matisse, who's starting the Fauvist movement that has kind of even started, has already taken off by this point. And then you also, the third thing you have is futurism, which is really from Italy that makes its way to, to Russia. And we've talked about a few of the, the um, Ukrainian and Russian artists that were deeply influenced by futurism. And in fact, there's also a Russian futurist movement that took over. So there's all of this news coming from abroad of cubism, futurism, fauvism, and a lot of other isms, and this, these Russian and Ukrainian artists uh, are think, like, what is our response going to be? How are we going to react to all this exciting stuff going on in the world? All of these people in Western Europe are, are like rejecting the, the 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 paintings of the past. What is? How are we going to? You know, so if we we're gonna follow that line, what unique thing can can we provide to the to the world that will be different from those? And fut again, there's Russian futurism which develops, and um, but the I guess what the Ukrainian and Russian artists do start to do is become more and more abstract. I probably taking a key from particularly futurism. And a little bit less so from cubism like we can see that the figures become more and more simplified into these blocky shapes um, and uh, like here's this is definitely that's a very futurist painting even though it, in you know futurism is an attempt to sort of portray the the movement of cars and trains and airplanes in a, on a flat canvas so like how do we how do you describe movement right that's kind of the futurism in a nutshell and you can see increasingly things get simpler and simpler he's also designing um, backdrops and costumes for some of the Russian ballets until about 1915 is the pivotal year here. We're still 1913. Here's a kind of cubist inspired stuff. You know, again, it's not uncommon for artists to try different styles. <gasps> here we go, the black square. There's the sketch that starts to appear. What's he gonna do with that, that black square? Um, I, I, we'll, we'll go back to, you know, one of the things that, that Malevich's student, I can't remember what her name was, but she even later wrote that 
in talking with Malevich, her teacher, he explained he didn't know what he was doing when he made that black square, but he felt it was very important and he had to paint it. And once he, and this sort of, by, it, it sort of occupied him for days. He didn't eat or sleep. It was, he was sort of like, you know, um, almost consumed or, um, like a, like a spirit had overtaken him is sort of the way that he describes it. Uh, again, you have these like very, these odd paintings, these sort of much more figurative, illustrative paintings that appear. And then like, look at this, boom, boom. Like, and you'll see, we'll see this, especially towards the end of his life where he then jumps back out of abstraction or non-representation or non-objective painting into more figurative work again, right? He's, he's kind of a little bit all over the place, although he tend, he goes more figurative work when Stalin comes around and bans this type of work that he becomes most famous for, these pure abstract paintings. Um, so here's the Black Square, 1915. Probably, it, it, you know, just seen by many people as the first purely abstract painting in art history. Now there's, I think maybe just a quick moment just to sort of talk a little bit about terms. If you think of like what an abstract painting is or what that word abstract means, right? It comes you know, like it's, um, if we start from an, let's say we take an apple, right? And we wanna make a painting of an apple. And if you try to paint that apple photorealistically, right, we're going to try to capture the shadows, the reflections, the shape of the apple, the colors, the all, you know, the table and the folds of the fabric that it might be sitting on, right? And one might call of that representational painting. We're trying to represent the painting to try to, to essentially sort of uh, create the illusion of that image onto a flat surface, right? Abstraction is we start to abstract that image, right? We're taking the apple and then we start to kind of take some things out, right? Well, maybe does it have to be red? Does it have to be a red apple? What if it was a blue apple or a pink apple or maybe a black apple? Right, so that's the, that we're abstracting from that so-called realistic image, right? And then we're like, well, does it have to be round? Does it have to be maybe? Could an apple be a square? Could we have a square black apple? Maybe. Okay. And then we start. So we start kind of moving further and further and further away from the quote-unquote original, and. That process is abstraction, right? Where it becomes less and less like the original and it distorts and changes and transforms and mutates. And to the point where at some point there's no quote unquote apple left and we have something entirely different that is beyond recognizability, right? And once it gets to that point, then we're talking about something that is there's no apple left, there's no appleness of the image remaining, and then we have something we might call not not just abstract painting, but non-objective or non-representational, right? That it's it's no longer representing anything except what it is, a black square on a white background. And it's interesting that you know, the paintings we're looking at here, these uh, quote unquote abstract paintings or probably more more properly known as non-objective or non-representational paintings. It's interesting that when these paintings were made, they were seen as, as, as very democratic, um, uh, very accessible artworks that anybody could appreciate. Now what's interesting is a lot of people look at this and like, I don't know what this is. Yes, I feel like I need a master's degree to appreciate this. This is just like, you know, um, I can, if I look at a painting of an apple or a person working in a field, I can get it immediately. 
But looking at this, it's like, pff, it goes right over my head. I don't know what I'm looking at. But that's very different to the way that these artists, were, when they were making these paintings, they th saw it totally differently. They, they saw those paintings of like the Mona Lisa and, uh, you know, even the Impressionists. They saw those paintings as paintings that required a master's degree to understand. Because like in, in let's say, the Mona Lisa, there are, often those artists would, cr would put things into those paintings that could literally be read right you're like oh okay there's um things like okay there's an empty shoe on the floor that empty shoe probably stands for uh impotence oh there's you know a star in the sky well that star is the guiding star like so there's all of this symbolism and um uh, that that artists kind of sneak into those paintings that allow us to read it and to understand it and often you'd have to be fairly knowledgeable to understand so it's in, in a way it's sort of like Greek um, mythology if you've ever read the Odyssey or the Iliad right they're they're great books on their own but they're even better if you know a little bit of the, the other stories that attach to it right and when I was in college, I, I took a Greek mythology class, and it was so cool to read some of these great books and then have somebody, oh, see, what he's talking about here, he's actually referencing another story. And that, and then the reason why he's carrying this thing over his shoulder is that reference isn't this. And so there's all of, and you're like, oh, wow, that makes the story so much richer. And that's the way that these artists also sort of, uh, saw paintings is it that they just exist on their own they're always tied to all of this other information and unless you were really smart and you had a college degree or you spend a lot of time looking at museums which at this time weren't free for everybody it was only the rich the the oligarchs and the kings and queens that could go to museums and to appreciate them you would just be like, I don't know what I'm looking at here. I, this is just like, was, and, I, and you'd feel really isolated and othered and not welcome. Malevich and the other constructivist supremacists, um, they saw these paintings as exactly what they are. It's a black square on a white background, or it's a red line and a bunch of red lines and a diagonal black line. That's all there is. You don't need to know anything else than that. It's purely non-objective, just shapes and color. That's it, right? And whether you like it or not, that's all it is, right? And, but the way that Malevich would, would, would cause he, he founded a movement called suprematism and suprematism is sort of goes beyond constructivism, which was the previous movement, which he was still a part of, which w was started um, by Kandinsky. Remember, we, we painted a Kandinsky painting. Constructivism was a, was exactly what we've just talked about all the way up until now, right? This non-objective, non-representational painting. Malevich, with suprematism, the movement that he founded, sort of takes it to the next level. And, and that is why he becomes very important to the next phase of like art history is that he says, okay, yes, all there is is black squares on white backgrounds and these geometric shapes. But in the contemplation of these paintings, it allows us to transcend to, a, to another um, plane of thought or existence that they become kind of spiritual, right? The, the It's, you know, you can almost think of it as like a kind of um, maybe Buddhist or something, this kind of looking into the void. There's there's n there's no distracting images of, of horses and uh, buildings and trees and people and dancers and whatever. It is just what it is. And, you know, like I, I meditate, I love, and one of the things is to clear your mind, right? You're trying not to think of words and images and you just let them wash over you. 
and you're just breathing, right? And in doing that, you can have these transcendental moments where you're just like, you you feel like you're hallucinating, and it's just like it's it's very wild and weird, right? And that's sort of what what he wanted his paintings to stimulate within the viewer is that you're looking at it and you're kind of not seeing anything but color and shape and line and you feel transported into a different world right you're allowed your own thoughts you don't you're not having to think you might start thinking about about how hungry you are or what you're going to do for um holidays or the person that you're in love with or the person that has just broken up with you as opposed to being forced to think about a horse or a landscape while you're looking at it there's nothing to look at but color and shape and in that way it opens the door for you to have your own entirely unique experience and that was it's hard to state how revolutionary that approach to thinking about images was and still is <laughs> That's what's incredible about it, is that these paintings are still relevant. They still shock people. They still upset people who will say, this is garbage, my kid could do that, this is awful. In some ways, because they don't want to be faced with an image like this. It's too much to contemplate that someone would be very serious about a painting like this and would spend their whole lives building to this particular moment. That the only way for some people to deal with it is by just ridiculing it, dismissing it. I don't want to think about it. It's garbage. No, nope, I'm not thinking. I'm not going to look at it. I don't want to even go to a museum that has that in the wall. I'm not thinking about it. Let's do something else. Right? There's a, there's a power in these types of images that still shocks people a hundred years later. And just think about how shocking paintings like that were back in the day when they were first created. And I want to see if... Okay, so here, let's just take a look at this here. So this is how Malevich um, hung these paintings that he made. This would, I think this is in 1915, this exhibition, this suprematist exhibition that he had and there it was a this is his room and i think he had 54 paintings in this room and you can see this is what they there's there was an exhibition at the tate museum in london uh, in 2014 where they tried to recreate the same image but look even this is the painting in question and he's hung it up in the corner the of the room right by the ceiling and which in and of itself, that is already kind of strange, right? To see any painting in there. But in Ukrainian Russian culture, often in people's homes, they would have a religious painting up in the corner. You might have, you know, Christ on the cross in the hung in this exact same way up in the corner of your house, right? Or your place of work, right? That's that's a very traditional way that 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 uh, families and businesses, you know, in the same way that here in Canada and the UK, you might have the queen in your home, or, you know, if you go to a legion, like a veterans organization here in Canada, you walk in the door, there's a picture of the queen, you take your hat off, right, when you walk in. This is very similar in, in Ukrainian Russian culture, you'd have like an icon of a religious icon hung in, in the house, right? So by Malevich hanging his painting in the corner, just like that, anyone in Moscow or Kiev or anywhere else who would walk into a museum or a gallery and see that, that, they knew what he was doing there. They would look and be like, almost like, whoa, that is, that's intense. That's, that's a, he's saying something here. He's saying that that black square for him is like putting Christ into the corner. And this is sort of his belief system. 
or maybe it represents Christ without, you know, in, if you think of like uh, Islam, it's, you're not supposed to, to, to um, depict Muhammad, right? So maybe, in, in, in there, it, there's been iconoclasts throughout Christian culture who've destroyed um, uh, Christian images and they're Christian themselves because they don't think it's proper to depict God or Jesus, Jesus being God himself. So some might say, well, maybe this is actually very appropriate, a black square, right? There's, there's no, there's nothing there. It's, this is just the, is, you know, it's, um, it's somehow pure, right? Anyway, that is, I, I know some people are like, oh, I rule. At this time, that would have been very, very shocking, and there, and no one walking in there would not know what he was intending to do with that type of a painting, in placing it in that particular space. Um, let's. Do I, I want to move on to the paintings I've been talking. Oh my goodness, I've been talking for a long time. Um, I want to. Let's. Let me see if. Okay, so I'm just gonna really quickly bring all this back home. So after, um, there's a period of time after Stalin comes to power in the 1930s, Malevich is is uh, uh, kind of arrested. He Many of his artworks are destroyed by the Russian authorities and his notes and stuff are taken away um, and he's, he's not allowed to to paint for a period of time, which I cannot remember. Maybe it even says in in here somewhere, but there's a, it's I um I can't remember if it was a couple months or a couple of years. I think it's more in the months, like two to six months or something. He's not allowed to to paint. When he's finally allowed access to his paints and brushes again, this is the type of image that he makes, right? Because Stalin. Like I mentioned earlier, is he does not like that abstract painting. He is like, this is ridiculous. This is embarrassing. That that we're trying to show the power of Russia, and we're we're gonna make a black square on a white background. That's embarrassing. That is humiliating. We want pictures of strong Russians marching and holding banners and building tanks, and that is what will inspire people, right? So. Malevich sent away, he comes back and he starts painting these kind of simplified figurative works which which bear resemblance to what we call synthetic cubism and um, he dies shortly thereafter I think in 19, so he gets cancer and, and dies in 1935 so um, interesting here, I just just scanning through I, I've, I've done watch a ton of videos and read some stuff so I haven't read the Wikipedia page so I'm just glancing critics derided Malevich's art as a negation of everything good and pure love of life and love of nature um, Malevich responded that art can advance and develop for art's sake alone saying that art does not need us and it never did Wow, that's, a, that's what a quote. I don't even know what that means. Art does not need us. It never did. Um, wow. So let's... <laughs> um, okay, you can see here too, when Hitler comes to power, he also bans Malevich's art. He also sees it as what he calls degenerate art. And there's a very famous exhibition that tours around Germany and Austria and the occupied Nazi territories called the Degenerate Art Exhibition, which ironically was wildly popular because it had all the Picassos and Matisse's and Malevich's paintings in there. Okay, so um, let's get back to painting. Um, so, the, I think at this stage, underpainting, we're not really gonna do an underpainting, we're just gonna get right to the painting itself. So, but we'll, okay, I think you all understand. S which one should we start with? Let's, let's start with the one on the thumbnail here, the black square, the famous black square. So, 
if we just look at the painting again just before we we work on it there's a number of different ways that we could approach this painting one of which is and i saw i maybe was it deborah that mentioned earlier yes deborah says michael there looks like different colors in the crackles perhaps i should go to my computer to see better and it's also easier to type you're definitely right deborah absolutely so there's in fact if we just zoom in here you will see that there are colors inside here um, now I'm not sure exactly why there's those colors there it's possible he painted colors and then painted black over top of it and when those cracks formed they, re they revealed colors underneath I would be I'm that's that, that is entirely possible I'd be willing to bet however that it's maybe more likely that this is a poor attempt at repairing the painting by maybe even himself or someone else after the fact and that that paint has changed color as it aged that's i, I mean who knows who, who no one well maybe probably a conservator could know because they would be able to x-ray and see the different layers of surfaces but um so when it comes to this painting if you I'm debating whether I want to use the crackling medium here. Uh, it's worth just sort of looking, just maybe before we begin, at how crackling m medium works. Come on. So crackling medium actually takes a little bit of time. So that's one reason I'm considering not doing it because we won't. I won't be able to show you the results now. We would have to wait a few days. But what crackling medium does is you let's say I apply it over top of this canvas right now and I just let it dry over the next 12 hours it's going to start to kind of pull apart and kind of like shrink the surface just like if you left a, a cup of milk out overnight it's going to form that kind of surface that's going to kind of wrinkle as it kind of shrinks um, as it dries crackling medium is a very very similar sort of thing so if you have this at home and you want to use it what you might want to do to start would be to paint oops I can't even see the square here um, I'm just gonna put this here so I can get the focus Um, if I was going to use a crackling material, what I would do is actually paint s some colors, potentially, if you wanted to do that here. And then I would paint the crackling medium over top of it, let it dry, and then I would paint black over top of that. Kind of, in, not, not too thick. And as it dries, what's going to happen is the cracks will form, the black surface will appear to crack, and we would see some color underneath. Um, I just don't know if I want, I almost am tempted to do that separate, no, maybe, should I do it, I, uh, let me think about, okay, so either, I just don't want this introductory class to throw too many things into the, into the, here so what I'm gonna do first I'm, I want to use tape in any instance here so I'm gonna take some tape this is just um, this is like scotch 2060 tape you, you can use I've used in, in the past on these episodes all sorts of different kinds of tape this is considered painters tape which is sort of made for this purpose not for necessarily painting on canvas but for painting your house right and if you put tape on the wall painters tape is made so that you can make nice sharp edges but then when you peel it off it's not going to leave residue on your wall or peel the existing paint off your wall which is really important right because you don't want to be putting a little bit of tape down to get a clean edge around your window seal peel off the tape and it peels off a couple of layers of paint and and that would be kind of could be very problematic so I am going to put this tape down I'm just looking at my lines that are there. If in doubt, I'm, rather than covering up this line, I want to leave a little bit of it visible. 
because that way the subsequent layers of paint are going to cover up that line. And trust me, I've learned that from experience before I would go right up to the line and what would end up happening, you peel that tape off and then you might see your pencil line shining through. Now we might want to do that for the other one, but uh... Okay, it's a little hard to see with these shadows. Again, I don't, I'm not so concerned about these lines being straight because one of the things Malevich did is some of these squares are actually deliberately wonky and weird, and um, so it's totally fine if yours gets a little wonky. Okay. Now it's even a little bit tricky for me to see my lines, so before I put this next bit of tape on here, I am going to make a few little lines so that I can see. And if you're having trouble, it's okay to use a ruler. I know I've, I'm kind of famous for saying I don't use rulers, but... I'm not going to draw on there. I'm just using this so that when I put my tape on here, I'm going to get relatively straight lines. And when in doubt, I'm going to use the edge of my canvas here to get a straight line because I can see with my tape. Okay, so the first step when using tape is I want to burnish this down to try to prevent paint from squeaking out underneath here. So I'm just using my fingernail to go over top of that edge in the corner. Okay, that's good. I've got that done. Now my next step, now I should also say I, I'm 99% sure Malevich did not use tape. I just want to use tape for this process because we haven't, I don't, we haven't talked about how to use tape and if you're just watching these episodes in order, you might be like, how do I use tape? We've never done that before. So that's why I'm doing this. So what I'm gonna do next, I'm, I'm using my matte medium. I put a little bit here. My matte medium is gonna dry clear. So I'm using it to paint over top of, of the tape here. And you can see now I'm gonna brush towards the center. Right? I don't want to push paint underneath the tape. All right, and I'm also trying to avoid getting any ridges here. Right? You want this to be kind of an invisible layer of paint. And the good thing if you're using clear paint like this is if some does squeak out underneath the tape, it's just going to be clear. And if you're... Um, so that's... It's going to make it barely noticeable that there was anything there to begin with. Uh, obviously, you know, if you, I prefer matte medium, not so that it's not shiny, because I tend to kind of paint in a way that, that doesn't use, make for shiny paint. But if you're using shiny paint, then you may want to use glossy medium or gloss medium. Okay. Now 
and again my I don't want to have ridges in here so I'm just going through that you could potentially paint all the way in the center if you wanted so let's put that in the water now I'm gonna blow dry this to try to um, because I want this to be nice and firmly sealed so I'm just gonna mute the microphone Interesting, just reading the comments, Paul says that the uh, original painting looks like a walking leopard. And I told, I see it. I see the walking leopard. I mean, maybe I, we see a different thing, but I see this is maybe the head. That's a front leg and back legs. And this is the torso. And the crackles sort of look like spots. That's cool. I like that, Paul. Uh, Holly says, did someone say underpainting? I have the lesson in the running in the background. <laughs> Uh, I did say underpainting. Not there's definitely a different approach to underpainting this painting. And Sandra says, or Holly says, oh, have a great day, team. Uh, Sandra says, I have texture paste laying around. Would that work? Probably not. Um, uh, texture paste would be for creating texture. Um, to, like you'd mix it in so that you could preserve the peaks and the the because often when we paint with acrylic you, you might like oh I love how that big texture and then you let it dry overnight and you come back and it's all flat and you're like what happened to all that cool texture so texture paste is you mix that in to your paint and then paint with it and then you come back tomorrow and it will look pretty close to the way it was when you left it right it won't as the water evaporates it won't collapse on itself um, I didn't have matte mediums. So I use GAC 100 because it seems like it'll work. Um, I, let me see. Do I have a GAC 100? <laughs> I have all of the GACs back there. Um, acrylic primer extender. I, I don't, can't remember. For extending acrylic paint. Hmm. Extender. And this is also glossy. So that's probably why I don't use it that often. One of the things that's great about these golden tubes is they got a little thing on here telling you. So it's transparent as opposed to opaque matte versus glossy it's very glossy and thin versus thick means it's like very watery um i would imagine like extending a paint can mean different things i would imagine extending the paint would allow it to um uh so you, you can, it's, I guess it's kind of like matte medium in the sense that it allows you to, it, to use that color, but spread it further. I, it doesn't look like it had, like I was just looking at my slow dry medium or my glazing fluid, sorry. The glazing fluid um, probably has a little bit of, uh, yeah, so it extends the working time, sorry. So, but this GAC 100 doesn't, which is probably very similar to matte medium. Although Golden, it does make their own matte medium. So, I, there's a lot of different mediums out there, and they're always cranking new ones out there, and it's debatable as to if it's just the same thing with a different label. Okay, so I've got this. I think I'm, I might do the crackling paste on this one. 
Um, <laughs> an hour and 40 minutes into this. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. So let's look at this. I'm going to just do this really quickly. I want to add a little bit of color underneath here. So I'm going to add, um, let's paint with, um, let's paint with the GAC 100. Has this been opened? Actually, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not. I don't want to introduce another medium <laughs> into this. I'm just gonna use my matte medium here because I feel like I'm already gonna have too many. So I'm gonna take my matte medium and I'm gonna mix a little bit of red into this color and. Let's look at these side by side. So maybe I'm going to paint again. I'm going to try to avoid my brush going in underneath here. Let's get a bit of yellow on my brush. Okay, that might be enough. <laughs> okay, so that's so I'm I am gonna put the crackling paste on here. If I didn't want to use crackling paste, we could still do this with like a, a number of thin layers of black, or we can use our make our own black. I'm gonna blow dry this, and then I'm gonna put my crackling paste over top of it, and then um, we'll put a, a, some black over top. So. It's gonna blow dry this. So the, the deal with this is if I apply this, I'm going to have to let it dry before I actually paint the black over top. So I'm just going to give it a good shake. So the bummer is, is when I'm not going to be able to finish this painting today. We'll have to wait. Um, let's get another brush. So I'm gonna paint this on, and then I may even remove the tape just so that um, I'm not. Sh I've never painted crackle paste with tape, and I'm a little bit worried that I might peel. It might peel off. So it's always I can always put that tape back down. But let's put some on here. The crazy thing with like crackle paste is it's almost like a living, oops, material. Is that it's going to 
have like a little bit of a life of its own. Because after we paint with it, it's going to start cracking. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to let this dry overnight. It's going to take about 12 hours, and then once that's uh, mostly dry, I'm going to paint my black over top of this. And then we'll see, ba hopefully by, by Thursday's episode, we'll be, I'll be able to show you the results of this whole process. Okay, so it's not very, this is very unsatisfying for this, but you know as i say once this dries it'll be kind of a little bit tacky but i'll paint my black i'll, pr I'll probably mix use this same paint and paint that right over top very thin layer it'll be i'll paint it enough that i will basically obscure everything underneath but hmm looks like it's gonna stay very watery i think i'll peel the tape off later tonight maybe before I go to bed hopefully this will be not quite as um, it'll have solidified a little bit by that point okay so let's move on to the other painting here which is also a, a fairly um, famous painting in its own right So, we're going to paint another white square here. So, you know, this one, though, is basically almost like the same gray that we had there before. You'll also notice there's a little bit of an outline here. I'm wondering if I should do this with tape or paint it. Because one Malevich would not have used tape. The technology of, of tape has has grown dramatically even over the past 10 years now we have tape that is like stronger than a weld in a building like you could literally build a building with tape and it would last longer than the welds um although you know <laughs> it's a new technology you never know in 10 years they could they could laugh at us forever thinking that but um Yeah, I'm gonna. T I'll use tape on this anyway. Just to stay kind of consistent here. So I'm gonna put this tape down, and I am wondering. I'm gonna do the the line around the edge afterwards. It's, it's interesting, like, I can see those lines, but as soon as I get the tape there, the shadow makes it hard to see the line. So just doing a little mark like that, I find, is so much more helpful. my matte medium again right I'm using my matte medium as opposed to gloss medium I'm gonna paint in here now it doesn't seem like this painting has suffered from the cracking as the other one so I'm not gonna do 
do that. So I'll blow dry that. So now, let's just look at the, the color. Basically, this color looks similar to the color that we used in the other painting uh, for our background. So I think I'm just going to mix that again, and we'll paint with it. So let's kind of repeat that process again. Whoa, I didn't mean for that much white to come out. Um, Let's see, I got these jars. So I'm just gonna put a bunch of that. Should be good enough. In here so it doesn't go to waste. And let's take our gray again. Let's mix this up. So even right here, that would be enough to paint because remember we made this a bit of like a brown All right if we paint with this already it's going to be different it's going to be very very subtle so i'm just going to make it a little bit less subtle by adding in fact i'm going to add a bit of let's going to take this matte medium that's right here I'm going to double my mixture because I don't have quite enough. Put a bit more matte medium. Maybe I would have needed most of that. Nah, I don't think I I just don't want to be too opaque. And we'll just, we'll paint with this and then we'll see because we could see the results well, I'm not sure if that comes across on camera. I can see the difference here already between these two colors. Again, I'm trying as best as much as possible to paint away from the tape so that I'm not forcing any paint underneath the tape. little blobs that keep accumulating. I'm just going to try to clean that up. It gets a little bit kind of, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't want to push paint up into there, but I think that's Okay, I'm going to blow dry that and I think I'm going to do just one more quick layer of the same paint just so it's going to, I can have, I want something to be subtle, 
but I also want it to show up on camera, right? Now, I, f I think if I paint, pulled the paint off right now, I would be happy, but I do think uh, another layer would be a good idea. Just to create a little bit more of a distinct difference between the two that people might at home might be able to actually see. So I've got my matte medium. Let's put a bit, mm, it might be too much black, let's see. The more and more layers, the, the more confident I can be that it's not going to be going underneath the tape, right? Now, you don't want to put too, do too much because after a certain point, then it can be, you can, the paint will have a hard time, to, you know, when you take that tape off. Sometimes it tears. So I think that looks good. I always just want to make sure that I've, I've actually gone all the way up and onto the tape because sometimes I forget to do that and maybe I'll just... Okay. So I'm going to blow dry that really quickly and then we're going to peel that tape. Okay, and then my favorite thing is peeling the tape off. It's always so much fun. Um, so, where should we start? Um, so, as I peel this tape off, I want to try to peel it towards the center not away from the center that way I get a nice sharp edge it's almost like the tape is cutting the the paint All right look at that beautiful sharp edge let's do the same over here
One thing you have to be careful with is your fingers, if they're dirty, you can accidentally get paint all over the canvas. So like I'm just sort of using my, the bottom of my hand to kind of brace this here. Look at that. That is gorgeous. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people like, that's crazy. I can't believe, like, I can't barely even see anything. I think that's really cool. I like the way that that looks. It's very subtle. Very subtle. I mean, it, probably some people are looking at that on their phones or, like, I don't know if I can even see that, but you've got this square right here maybe even if I go maybe that's makes it a little bit more visible um, I think that's great I like that a lot that's very cool like it's very strange and weird it's, it's, it's I guess you could say it's pretty simple I wish the other one could be done so we could see them side by side. Maybe I'll do a quick episode where I, I maybe yeah. When I do the next few steps, I'll, I'll film that and do maybe a short twenty-minute video showing how that works. But um, that, that makes me happy to see this at the stage. So uh, maybe I'm just gonna quickly blow dry this before I do any because what can happen is right at the edge we probably still have maybe a little bit of wet paint there so it's always before you start kind of like ah, oh, it feels so neat feeling those edges and then you go Pew! and it's like a zip pops oh no right so you just I'm just gonna blow dry that for extra safety. So, um, let's, I think we're at that time here. So, let's now do a little bit of a side-by-side -side comparison of these paintings and just see how they turned out. So, maybe just quickly before, just there was a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Take a photograph of the painting you made and upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate in your achievement. And if you felt like this was at all interesting and it was worth the price of a cup of coffee, considering leaving a donation, there's the PayPal link in the description below or you want to contact me through Facebook or my website, you can certainly do that. Okay, so let's, we'll start with the one that we just finished and we'll look at them side by side. So, I, okay, so this here, again, it looks a little bit different. Maybe I should even get a piece of wood and put this underneath here. Uh, 
Okay, so, you know, as I look at them side by side, I do feel maybe I could have gone even darker there. Um, but there's something about the subtlety that I really like. Now, you could see that he did, there's a kind of a little line around here. I would be, I, I would suspect that's actually his pencil line that he used to sort he knew where the square was, where he was gonna paint in. So we could actually take a pencil and go around and do a very soft line around it, or we could preserve the line as it is. Personally, I think I'm gonna keep my painting just as it is, because I think I, oops, I like how that looks. But uh, I could see some people doing a, a little gentle outlining. Even you could use like a gray Posca pen and sort of do a little bit of an outline if you like. There's something about the simplicity of this that really appeals to me. Again, this is not the kind of painting that I make, that I exhibit and sell and all that kind of stuff. Um, which is why I love doing this kind of thing, because it's really walking in someone else's shoes for a little bit, and it's kind of fun. Because then it starts to open your mind and be like, this is not the kind of painting I normally make. Why not? Like, wh what's to say that I don't start making paintings like this? So, um, I don't think I'm gonna start making paintings like this, but it is kind of fun. So, we'll, I'm gonna move, actually, well, let's just see if we zoom in on anything, if we can notice any particular details. Let's see if we can make the, sure that's in focus. So you can see we've got some really nice sharp edges in here. In fact, I don't think I had any bleeding whatsoever. You can see there's some little chunks of paint that got in there. That's what I was trying to wipe away at different times. I don't mind that. There is a little bit of these that's actually some black that wasn't fully mixed into my paint that, that appeared. But in, in a way, with a painting like this, sometimes those little imperfections can take on extra meaning. Like you can see there's that, right? It's possible that later tonight when the lights get down low and I'm looking at this, that I'll see, you know, like Paula was saying, seeing the cheetah or in the, <laughs> in the other painting, All right? So, you know, even if you don't want to do this particular painting, learning that taping technique can be really helpful. I know a lot of people in the Facebook group have used it for lots of other things. Um, so it doesn't you don't just have to use tape for abstract painting. And then we'll just take a look at what this painting's at at this particular stage in time. So this is going to be the black square. It doesn't look like it at the moment. And I, I certainly don't think it ever looked like this when Malevich was painting it. But it is kind of fun just to, to play around with a few different materials that I don't usually use in the studio. Or I haven't used crackling paste on any painting so far. And we're at painting 220 or episode 220. Um, right now, this is still very tacky. Like... Um, and I think it's going to be like this for probably all the way up until like you're supposed to leave it for 12 hours before you paint anything on top of it. And even then, when you paint over top of it, you want to do it kind of quickly because otherwise it the water in the paint will reactivate this. So I'll, I'll film it. Maybe I'll do a quick live stream showing me doing it. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But um, uh, you... It's, it reminds me actually a lot of um, when I did the Mark Rothko painting and I mixed the egg white into the paint. It has the same sort of look and shine as, uh, as that egg white does. And it seems to be sort of behaving the way. There's some bubbles in there that, that have gone away. And I think as the paint dries, those, hopefully those bubbles will have completely dissipated. Um, if you were interested, let's see if we just zoom in a little bit. I don't think there's much to be gained by zooming in close, 
again, the reason I painted these colors here is so that when the paint does crack, we should see a little bit of those colors coming through in between the cracks, which should be kind of cool and give us a little bit of the effect that we see from the original, right? Because when we... Yeah, I'd, I'd venture to say that's poor conservation more than him painting something underneath, but you never know. It's really, it could also just be the photograph and the way what happens when it gets reduced, etc. Okay, well, that brings us to another end of another episode. Thank you everyone for joining me, for painting along with me and uh, celebrating this incredible Ukrainian artist who changed the world. I, you know, again, we might think like, so the guy painted a black square and a white background and a bunch of, you know, elitist art historians, it tickled their fancy and they're all excited, wrote some books and that's the end of it. I, that, that one might say that but just think about like how the introduction of an idea of abstraction or non-representation how the ripples of that ripple out into the world this idea of not focusing on representing images and instead representing uh, ideas or feelings and, or, and, and allowing the viewer more space for their own contemplation rather than blurting a message out to people and then people receiving that message is to like in, in a totally opposite way of just opening a space for people to have their own experiences and for those experiences to be very different than anybody else's is quite radical and you know, it, it makes me think of a class that I had, I took years ago when I was in graduate school, I took a class on the films of Andy Warhol, and uh, which people ridiculed, it was even in the newspaper saying, oh my goodness, what a, the, Warhol's films are famously boring and bad. There's a movie called Sleep of just a guy sleeping for eight hours. How in interesting could that be? He made a movie of the Eiffel Tower for 12 hours, I think. And it's just the camera's just pointing at the Eiffel Tower. How boring. And uh, that's what I thought at first. I was like, well, it's, the teacher is kind of a really cool, famous teacher. It'd be interesting to take that class and just study from him. And maybe some interesting things will come up from it. And the, that class changed my life. Because what was so interesting is when you're sitting in a movie theater for three or four hours watching someone sleep... And it's not just one angle, it is sort of cutting back and forth. I, I'm not trying to dispel the fact that it's not like as it was like visually amazing and but it does it, it was such a totally different experience of watching a movie than I've ever had before. It was a lot more like looking at a painting. You know, especially if you contrast that type of experience of watching Warhol's films to watching you know, the latest Marvel superhero movie where it's just like constantly like you're being barraged by stuff, flashing lights, the editing, no, nothing is on screen for more than, you know, two or three seconds. So you have to be fully absorbed into the movie, right? I mean, we've all been at a movie where you're like, you got to go to the bathroom, but you're like, oh, if I go to the bathroom, I'm going to miss so much. Oh, I'm just going to hold it until until you have to go. And then you come back in and, and you're like, what did I miss? And your friend's like, I'll tell you when we, we'll go for a drink afterwards because like pff, so much happened. You're like, oh, I missed half the movie. Warhol famously stated that he wanted to make a movie where people could get up in the middle of the movie go to the lobby, grab a bag of popcorn, go outside, smoke a cigarette, maybe go home and take a nap, come back and haven't missed anything. Which again, I know sounds ridiculous, and that's how I felt at first, but then in retrospect, or at least slowly watching the movie, it was like, 
wow, this is so nice. Like I get to have this moment where I, everything just sort of slows down. And I'm looking at something, but now I start thinking about my own self. I start feeling the blood pumping through my body. I start th breathing and it becomes a very meditative experience. It becomes m more internal than sort of uh, being like, I, I, I have an ex interior experience with myself than just being barraged by colors and lights and stories and stuff, which is very overwhelming. And sometimes you leave those movies and you just feel exhausted. You're like, oh my God, I got a headache. It's just there's so much. So that was, I cannot overstate how profoundly influential that was. And I think about that same sort of thing that I, I, I can't imagine Warhol would have even have considered doing something like that had it not been for Malevich making the black square and telling people it's okay to go into a museum and to have your own experience that a painting doesn't need to shout at you with an image and tell you this is what to think this is what to feel this is what to do this is you know like this is what it is you look at it and you're like oh it's just a black square I'm gonna have my own uh, reaction I don't know it's it's profoundly different of an experience whether you appreciate it or not this is totally up for debate some people think it's absolutely ridiculous and that's totally fine everyone is welcome to have their own sense of taste and I encourage you to to like things and to dislike things and that's okay but I think it's important to understand you know what you know what would motivate somebody to make some of those paintings and I think as time has gone on I used to hate abstract painting or non-objective painting it drove me crazy it felt like it was an inside joke that I wasn't a part of and didn't understand it wasn't for me everyone's laughing except me and I'm the only one who's like what's so funny and then as I've sort of gotten older I'm like I have a much different appreciation for it it's not like I want to make paintings like Malayevic has done but I do feel like oh I'm glad there was somebody who did that that's cool now I don't have to spend my career doing that but it's definitely cool when people expand the boundaries of what is possible right so um, thank you everybody enjoy the rest of your evening there are links in the description to support uh, organizations that are providing humanitarian uh, and medical relief for refugees in Ukraine. At this moment, there's a war going on and thousands and thousands of people are desperately in need of aid that are injured or um, have you know, severe trauma and children, women that are trapped in the war zones. Their Doctors Without Borders goes to those locations, helps people. They put their lives on the line to save people in the middle of a war zone. There's the, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, there's the Canadian-Ukraine Organization, which is helping supply uh, medicine and uh, basic necessities to people who are, once they get out of Ukraine into Poland, and um, uh, Hungary and various other countries neighboring Ukraine provide them with places to stay and even bring them to Canada and to the United States um, as either temporary refugees or to become permanent residents. So please strongly consider leaving it again in lieu of giving me a dollar, consider giving them some of your support. And uh, I think they'd be very, very appreciated. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you guys on Thursday. I'm going to give a little update to this painting, maybe at the beginning of that class. We'll see how that, that all goes. Have a great night, everybody. We'll talk to you again very soon. Good night.